get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, Hint Water, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25's mission is to connect business owners to, to their ideal peers, customers, and referral partners. We do it in three ways. We help your company completely run and launch your own podcast that we distribute across 11 or more different channels, including a dedicated blog post per episode. So you just show up and talk and we do everything else. We do live in-person VIP days and receptions with top entrepreneurs all over the country. And we do a done for you lead generation service where we manage a consistent outreach to ideal clients and referral sources. This is not paid traffic, by the way. Since this requires a lot of humans to do the work, we have limited bandwidth and we only want to work with the right company. So if any of you sound interesting, go to rise25.com and contact us. I am very excited. Today we have Stefan Aristol, the founder of Tower Paddleboards and the No Middleman Project. Founded in 2010 and funded by billionaire Mark Cuban, Tower Paddleboards is one of the biggest success stories in Shark Tank history. You know, Stefan, I get to brag about you because I'm me and not you, so I'm going to brag for a second. But with only $100,000 in lifetime sales at the time of the pitch, Mark Cuban invested just $150,000. Since then, Tower has done over $30 million in sales. Tower was the number one brand out of over 2 million third-party sellers signed up for the Pilot Amazon Exclusives program. They also have branched into Tower Electric Bikes and Tower Beach Club, which we'll talk a little bit about also. Stefan moved his whole company to a five-hour workday and wrote a book titled The Five-Hour Workday about the experience, which would spread the idea to tens of millions of people worldwide. I think it even caught on a lot in Germany as well. Um, He founded the No Middleman Project, which is a searchable directory and online showroom for the world's best consumer products and brands. Harvard did a business school study on how they leveraged Amazon for sales. Uh, Stefan, thanks for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. The five-hour workday. Talk about, first of all, people should check it out. Um, I was trying to convince you subtly to do, do an audible version when we, before we started because I would, I would <laughs> for sure that. consume it in like the next two days if it was there. I just know sometimes <laughs> that's just more of my style uh, of listening. But what were some, uh, you know, before they check out the book, um, what was like one or two tests that you um, did within the company? So uh, essentially, the, the five-hour workday book, it wasn't like we planned a book. We just moved the company to a five-hour workday in 2015. Um, and this is kind of how I'd been working for the last uh, 10 years, probably at the time, was coming to work uh, and do what I need to do and get out of there, right? And it, a lot of times, I was the only person in this company. So if I needed, you know, I have a son, if I needed to take a two-week vacation, I was designing my business so that I could, you know, walk away from that. And uh, I mean, a lot of it was based on Tim Ferriss's, you know, four-hour work week. And that was how an an entrepreneur, an individual, could sort of get a bunch of, you know, other people doing his work for him, outsourcers and stuff like that, automate processes and and stuff like that. And so that's how I was working and I was being very successful with it. And a lot of my entrepreneurial, uh, you know, friends were working in that fashion. And I looked kind of at everybody else in the economy and a lot of these, you know, corporations that were struggling. And I'm like, why isn't everybody working like this? And then I thought, well, Jesus, you have a company and, you know, you have all you're working startup hours and you're, you're pushing these guys. Like, why don't you give them the same incentives that you have as an entrepreneur? And so uh, I was like, I think it was June 1st in 2015. You know, I walked in and I said, like, look, OK, we're going to move to a five hour workday. It's going to be 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. straight through. There's going to be no lunch. And I want everybody here to basically figure out how to do your jobs. So. Here's the, here's the give and take. I'm going to give you your life back. You're literally going to walk out the door at one o'clock. That's going to change your life. You're going to have a work week that's better than most people's, you know, vacation. And then you still have weekends. Um, but on the, the ask side is 
you know, uh, no more fantasy football at work, uh, no more online shopping at work. Uh, I don't want you screwing around on Facebook. You're not going to have enough time. If you do that stuff, you're probably going to get fired because, you know, your work's not going to do. Yeah. And if you basically can't do the same thing you were doing before or more, you're going to be fired. So I'm going to give you basically the incentive uh, package that an entrepreneur has. Um, you have to perform. And if you can't perform and condense your time, uh, you'll be fired. And if you can do it, you're going to have your life back. And it wasn't just about uh, incentivizing my existing staff, but it was about uh, what's my staff going to look like five years from now. I want to be able to attract all of the people that work at three times the speed of everybody else. But in most companies, uh, you know, they make 20 percent more than the rest of the people and they carry the, the workload. So I wanted to repel the people mm. uh, that were sort of sloth like and get all of these high performers into my company. Mm. And so that was the thing. And we were going to do a three month test was the idea. And well, I was going to see who were my uh, high performers and who were not my high performers. Yeah. And, uh, you know, then I'd sort of clean house. And after three months, it was working so well that we just sort of kept it on. And it uh, it just continued. Um, it uh, That was the, the general idea. And there was no, uh, you know, this is a critique that the book gets a lot. It's like, okay, well, you explain this process. And you went in here and you showed what happened with your company. Uh, but but tell me, what do I need to do to work this five-hour workday? Well, it really depends on your job. And we didn't bring in an efficiency expert and analyze our shipping function or analyze our retail function or anim analyze how the customer service people were doing or analyze what the marketing people were doing. Everybody did what became their own efficiency expert. And I just said, well, figure it out. Just examine, spend a couple hours of your day examining yeah. how you're working. And are, are there things that you can just stop doing and, and, right. and they would work better? And so that is the magic. It's putting pressure on people. It's no different than you know finals week in, in college. All of a sudden, you know, that 45 page paper that you, you know, couldn't write all semester gets done in 24 hours uh, because there's time pressure. And without that time pressure, yeah. uh, people just fill voids. And this is what's been going on in the last 40 years in, in America and probably around the world is all this technology has been thrown at us. And suddenly, you know, we're working the same hours and not getting we're getting, a, you know, a minimal more productivity than, you know, my mom was working in a, in a bank with a typewriter. Um, you know, mailing letters. Right. And, right. You know, it's crazy. Like we should be a hundred times more productive than them. And the entrepreneurs in the world are, and the other people aren't. So you need to yeah. put time pressure on organizations and companies um, at large. Totally. I mean, I think I'm not sure if it's Parkinson's law, but I think it's Parkinson's law. Basically, you have a space, and you will just fill up the space because sure. it's there. But the same thing goes with time, right? And I think I don't know if you said this or it's in the book or both. But I think you said the shipping time went from five minutes to like 2.6 minutes. And it's not like yeah. you gave them specific direction on what to do. They just figured it out. Exactly. <laughs> I'm like, why haven't we done this before? You know, but they were just and that's the funny thing is the shipping people were kind of looking at me when I sort of made the announcement that we're going to move to this. Like, uh, I understand how that might work for you guys. Uh, you know, they're staring computers here, but <laughs> it's not really going to work for us. But the, the thing is, we didn't even have to get any new tools, any new software. They basically you, you learned to use and utilize the software they had to its full capacity, which they just hadn't done before because there just was no pressure there. Because these guys could literally go surfing at one o'clock if they wanted to. That was huge motivation for them. Right. So they're like, we don't have to clock hours here. Let's get this stuff done. How can we do this faster? Let's you know get a little pep in our step. And some of it is is identifying tools that make your work faster. Some of it is just working at a faster clip. And the other part is just eliminating waste. And between all three of those people, all three of those things, I mean, before we were working, uh, you know, a nine to five day with an hour lunch, that's really a seven hour day. You know, even though I said we're startup hours, that was a seven hour day. And then there's time wasted before lunch and after lunch. So we really only reduced a seven hour day to five hour days, but we did it such that we put lunch after work um, and you eliminated waste around lunch. I mean, that is a very easy thing to do. So it's not too surprising. We were barely working less, really. And we were, you know, but we were focused on efficiency. What, I, I don't know if you get this question, but so like customer service and everything like that, you guys do a really good job with, but then what happens after one? People are calling, yeah. people are emailing. What, what do you do after that? Do you just have a second shift or something of people? You have the second <laughs> See, this is this is it's a funny question yeah. because people assume like in today's world, like, you know, I had buddies before we even did this, like you need to get a call center answering the phone 24 hours a day. 
And I'm like, no, we're not 7-Eleven. You know, we're not like the all night, uh, you know, lumber store. I want my paddle board like, now. I don't care if it's like, midnight. Exactly. I want People to be able to paddle board phone. every five years. <laughs> like it's not that urgent. And most right. businesses in the world are just not that urgent. And you're kidding yourself. And so, yeah, we can man the phone 16 hours a day and we're going to get an incremental, uh, yeah. you know, better experience for the customer and an incremental more of sales. But maybe if you cut it to five, you only lose 5% of the sales and you piss off a few people that are kind of unrealistic in what kind of customer expectations. Nobody cared. So you found it I didn't mean, really it, make a difference. It didn't, it didn't like eight hours is totally arbitrary. And the, this is the thing I talk about in the book. It goes over the history of, um, you know, the work hour. And basically the eight hour day was invented in like, you know, 1913. It was just Somebody just magically invented this, and then we all just sort of went along with it. <laughs> you know why they invented it? Yeah. They invented it because all of a sudden you had the Industrial Revolution, and you have these machines that can work 24 hours a day, and productivity went through the roof. And what happened is oh, people tried to keep up with the machines, and then they were working 12-hour days, and they were working 16-hour days. People were dying and getting maimed on the factory floors, and they said, this is un unstable because I'm, my workers are dying, basically, right. getting hurt. So they said, okay, a more sensible way here is we're gonna have three shifts of eight hour days. So the machines will work full time and then we'll rotate people around this clock. That's where the eight hour workday came from. Mm. Now, why in the hell is a lawyer or a, you know, a marketing agency using an eight hour day? Makes no sense at all. Nobody's, nobody's just sat back and thought, like, what would be the optimal uh, day for us to work? We just uh, let's go with these factory workers from 100 years ago. Right. That um, makes perfect it, sense. <laughs> it makes no sense. <laughs> Nobody works in a factory anymore. Totally. In the U.S. So, Stefan, first of all, thank you. I really appreciate your time. I have two last questions. Um, everyone should check out TowerPaddleBoards.com, NoMiddleMan.com, 5HourWorkDay.com, and check out what they're doing because whatever you're doing, it's, it's innovating. It's trying to stay ahead of where the puck is going and everything like that. So thank you for sharing. This has been really valuable. Um, I always ask, uh, since it's Inspired Insider, what's been a low moment? And what's been a proud moment? Um, because, you know, in companies, it's not always just sunshine. You know, there's like you have to make payroll. You have to actually make tough decisions. What's been a, a tough moment that you had to push through? I mean, we're, we're kind of going through a tough moment now with this whole um, the Internet sales tax, um, you know, issue that's come up. Because we essentially have, you know, states coming after us and saying, you know, you owe us a sales tax that you didn't collect from consumers that you didn't know, you know, another company wasn't collecting. And it's it's just there's there's as any business when you start out in the online space, it was very simple. It's a very simple business. You know, we get to the top of the SEO, we get there, we have paddle boards. But as businesses go along, the complexity adds to it. And now you've got e-commerce that's going along and a lot of unnecessary complexity is being added to it. And one of those things is with the sales tax thing. Like I, as a, as a, you know, a business owner, you know, pay my taxes, I do that, I have no problem with that, I'm more than happy. I'm more than happy to, you know, tomorrow collect tax from everybody in the country and that's kind of what we're being forced to do now. But now we have to hire two people to figure out what tax to collect in 9,000 different tax jurisdictions around, you know, 50 different states. We have to register in 50 different states yeah. and we have to report, you know, monthly in this day in court. It's just, it's an insane like thing. Like if you want me to collect tax, just let's have one tax, national sales tax, I'll submit it and then you can just split it among your states, like make it simple. So now you have to spend so much time doing those things. And then with online marketing too, there's so many different online marketing channels. You got Facebook, you got LinkedIn, you got Instagram, you've got AdWords, now you've got these content delivery networks, and then you've got video, and then you've got all of this stuff. So now you got to bring in, you know, experts, and then the experts come in. And this is like, you know, uh, the doctor and lawyer problem is that, you know, now they're going to charge you $500 an hour to, uh, you know, do these complex things that you're not smart enough to do. And that, to me, is annoying. And that's not about uh, business is, is creating value. Right. And, right. I think a lot of the whoever complete creates complexity in this stuff is uh, <laughs> is uh, it's just it's counterintuitive to creating new products and stuff like that, and it's it's annoying to me. So when when a business gets like that, I'm kind of like you know this yeah. isn't a business that I want to I want to be in. Um, so I try to bring uh, simplicity uh, back into things. Um, so 
yeah, that's, you do it. That's, that's one of the depressing things about. It. Yeah, you do it for the end consumer, and then all these other complexities get thrown in, and it doesn't allow you to do what you set out to do, essentially. Yeah, and yeah. that that to me is that to me is frustrating. Yeah, and that's part of the no middleman thing. Is I want to bring you know I don't want to have to look at a hundred different you know e bike companies. I want to look at three. I want simplicity, and I think a lot of people are getting that way. The, the world yeah. is getting a lot more complex. And yeah, we can have artificial, you know, intelligence run the whole thing, but maybe just simplify some things, you know, yeah. like here in California, we have uh, in and out Burger, you know, you got three menu items. Right. <laughs> There's beauty. There's beauty in that business model to me. Totally. And then proud moment. What's been especially proud moment for you? Um, I don't know. I think the, being on the Inc. 500. Um, was really sort of a proud moment because that's when I got out of college, that's how I'd look for a job. I got the Inc. 500 and I just went down those companies and I looked, well, what companies are in my town? And I just walked in there and said, I'll work for free for you because, you know, you're doing something, you're going somewhere. And uh, it never really occurred to me that I would have a company that, that wasn't any kind of 500 company that I started myself. So that was a, yeah. that was a pretty, you know, proud moment. Yeah. Stefan, first one to thank you. This has been fantastic. Everyone should check out all the websites I mentioned and uh, really appreciate your time. Hey, thanks. Thank you much. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better.